Welcome to Censored. I'm Mifa Vritnach, smut seeker extraordinaire who'll read any kind of book if it promises filth. I'm determined to find the obscenity, even if it is small, and sometimes I'm afraid it is very small indeed. If you like the podcast, please rate and review it, because that helps other people to find it. I'm on Patreon if you're able to subscribe. There are show notes and extra long interviews with guests over there. Check out the links in the episode notes for more. This episode features the one and only James Bond. Ian Fleming's Diamonds Are Forever was published in 1956 and banned straight away. It was the fourth Bond book Fleming had published, but the first one to be censored. Bond had been a commercially successful character since his first book, Casino Royale, was published. I don't know why the censors didn't mind the first three books, because their ways are mysterious. Having spent many lazy weekends as a kid watching Bond, I thought it would be fun to actually read a Bond novel. I'm guessing lots of you are, like me, more familiar with the film than the book Bond. Most of the elements are the same, of course. Bond is a British spy managed by M. His double O codename means he has a license to kill. Both the book and film of Diamonds Are Forever feature exotic places and international travel. As usual, James Bond acts alone, working to defeat the forces of evil that menace international order. Or Britain's self-interest, because they're pretty much the same thing, right? All the time, I'm afraid, he's being a massive racist. I'm giving you a content warning here. There's some nasty shit coming your way, and I really am sorry about that. But I'm going to stop now before I go into a full-scale rant about it, and quickly pause for a drink. Now, there's only one drink associated with James Bond, a vodka martini, shaken, not stirred, and it should be garnished with a twist of lemon. This is a whoppingly strong drink, six parts vodka to one part vermouth. Insane! But if that isn't your thing, there's a huge range of drink in this novel. You could enjoy champagne, only the most expensive variety, of course, or partake of bourbon and water. When Bond is in the US, he adopts local habits, hence whiskey and water, which is supposed to be spring water rather than tap water. Don't quite understand that, but it was explained to me in detail, so I feel like I should tell you to. His love interest, with the usual ridiculous name, Tiffany Case, drinks a cocktail called a Stinger, made with cognac and creme de menthe. There's also a lot of coffee. On a brief stopover in Ireland, Bond drinks an Irish coffee, combining booze and caffeine at the same time. One of the more unusual things for me about this novel was the sheer quantity of food and drink consumed. Fleming uses eating to allow characters to explain the plot to each other. Dinner as exposition. It's actually terribly boring to read. This time I'm going to forgo the Bond cocktail, because they sound nasty. I'll be sticking with coffee, but I'm neither classy nor macho like Bond, so I'm drinking it heavily adulterated with sugar and cream. He would absolutely sneer at such namby pambiness. This particular novel is mostly set in the US, taking in Las Vegas, New York and Kentucky. The premise is that an Italian-American gang is smuggling diamonds out of southern Africa, thereby denying the diamond dealers their fair share of profit. And when the jewels aren't traded, the London diamond market doesn't make as much money, and therefore the government doesn't get a big tax cut. So you call in the Secret Service to safeguard government profits made on international capitalism. I'm not feeling that Bond is a goodie in this one. Not that I'm on the side of the villains, but stealing diamonds from a massive international conglomerate that exploits the workforce doesn't feel like a terrible crime. I may as well fess up at the start. I have no idea why this was banned. Film Bond, as you know, leps into women's knickers a lot, but novel Bond is very restrained. Tiffany, the hot babe, hardly features at all. And when Bond does notice her, it's more about the expensive clothes she's wearing than, say, her physical attributes. I'll read you out this bit from chapter 23 to show you what I mean. 
She was wearing a heavy cream shantung silk shirt and a charcoal skirt in a cotton and wool mixture. The neutral colours showed off her café au lait sunburn. The small, square Carter watch with a black strap was her only jewellery and the short fingernails on the small brown hand that lay over his were unpainted. It's a bit clinical, isn't it? It's like a fashion magazine, telling you exactly what everything is made of. I'm surprised he doesn't tell me how much it costs. I suppose by sunburn, though, he does mean sun-tanned, because it doesn't sound like she's got red peeling skin, does it? Now, the very first time he saw her, Bond did fancy her, but in a clinical, impersonal way. There's no inflamed passion or dirty thoughts. When I read on through the novel, I got slightly annoyed at the lack of sexual shenanigans. I was halfway through and I still hadn't found anything salacious. So, in despair, I keyword searched the ebook. I decided to choose the most popular bingo term, breasts. It's a fairly reliable indicator. I only got seven results, six of which were about men's clothing, breast pockets, you know, that sort of thing. And there was just one sentence about Tiffany's boobs from chapter nine. When Bond lights her cigarette, she leans across the table towards him and, quote, the valley between her breasts opened for him. And that's it. Pretty disappointing. It's also an awful sentence. When I thought about reading bits out aloud, I did get the giggles. I can't even envisage this because... Surely her breasts would swing closer together as she's leaning over. Is she wearing a bra? What sort of bra? I mean, there are just so many questions and it's a sign of bad writing when you have those questions. It's just silly. If you had purchased Diamonds Are Forever for all the hot Bond girl action, you'd be very disappointed. Tiffany doesn't sleep with Bond till the very end and it's kind of romancy and noble rather than a fling. At the very beginning of the book, we're told that Tiffany was gang raped as a teenager, so she's completely unavailable and hates all men. Naturally, this traumatised young woman finds Bond irresistible after just one dinner, because that's the kind of guy he is. Women just melt before him. Because of his moral scruples, he doesn't want to make his move in case he damages her. But to be honest, the plot doesn't give him much time to hang out with Tiffany, He spends most of the book with an old spy colleague called Lighter. For the vast majority of the time, Tiffany isn't even on the page. When she does return, Bond notes that she can deal cards really well, so she's not just a pretty face. Nice that a Bond girl actually gets a skill, isn't it? Interestingly, she actually saves his life. She's pretty much the only reason he escapes a gang who are trying to beat him to death. At the very end, they end up on a luxury liner back to Britain. And there the inevitable surrender happens. This is chapter 23. We have been waiting long enough. I am reading this out against my sense of taste. But here we go anyway. They came to the door of Tiffany's cabin, but she pulled him away and on down the long, softly creaking corridor. I wanted to be in your house, James, she said. Bond said nothing until he had kicked the door of his cabin shut behind them and they had twisted round and stood locked together in the middle of the wonderfully private, wonderfully anonymous little room. And then he just said softly, My darling, and put one hand in her hair so that he could hold her mouth where he wanted it. And after a while his other hand went to the zip fastener at the back of her dress, and without moving away from him she stepped out of her dress and panted between their kisses. I want it all, James, everything you've ever done to a girl, now, quickly. And Bond bent down and put an arm around her thighs and picked her up and laid her gently on the floor. I really think this is terrible. This just redundant detail, too many words. I don't need to know why he has to hold her head in that way. You know, I've read better fan fiction than this. From the point of view of the censors, I suppose Tiffany saying, I want it all, James, would be bad, because in their minds, single girls were not supposed to have sexual urges. But it's pretty tame stuff, isn't it? American Pulp Fiction that I've read by, say, Hank Jansen or Ori Hitt was steamier than this tripe. It was also better written, you know, snappier, more atmospheric, better characterization. 
I mean, this is just flat. As critics have pointed out, the function of the Bond girl is to reflect Bond back to himself. She's more of a plot device than a character. And this is true quite often of Tiffany. When the mob rumble Bond, her eyes are full of fear for him when, let's be honest, she should have been scared shitless for herself, if we're going to do realism. Her expensive clothing tells us nothing about her. Like, what's her style? Her personal style doesn't emerge. But it does tell us everything about how designer labels are integral to Bond's character. He approves of her nice clothes, and that's what gives her some personality. The strongest aspect of his character is his taste for fine things. Of course, there's no ostentation in Bond's palette. He likes things to be branded and expensive, but nothing flashy. How very elite English of him. Showing off wealth is just far too common. Indulgences for the vulgar lower classes. I'm familiar with this suave sophistication from the films, of course. It's what makes Bond attractive. But I found the novel character repellent for precisely the same reasons the film version is interesting. His eye for expensive goods is so coldly materialistic, so assessing that it turned me right off. So he doesn't admire the dress on Tiffany because it looks well on her or because it's a beautiful item. He likes the label because it just says the right sort of expensive. He admires her fingernails because they're unpainted and her face because it isn't covered in makeup. It's all so prim and proper and fastidious and anally retentive. Bond's gaze is just so all-consuming as well. It saturates the entire text. Everything revolves around him. Because Fleming doesn't use a very clear first-person point of view, I felt like that Bond kind of hijacks the third-person point of view as well. Honestly, it was just creepy as fuck. It was like being suffocated by a narrow-minded snob. As bad as all that nonsense about watches and dresses and shoes was, the food scenes were even worse. At the beginning, I didn't really notice them. But as I read on, he seemed to be eating a lot of meat, cutlets, lobsters, steaks, and I began to feel sort of queasy. Now, I'm not a vegetarian, so there's no good reason for that. There's actually a lot written about the role of food in Bond novels. To be honest, I couldn't believe how much had been written about him at all, compared to some of the more um, accomplished literary works that I've read for the podcast before. But there are a lot of academic fans of Bond turning their love of the franchise into scholarship. The analysis of food in his universe was definitely the most fun part of anything I read. There was a particularly memorable one about eggs that was so much fun. I really enjoyed it. Everyone agrees that all this eating was part of the appeal of the Bond novels, as distinct from the films. Before the first film was released in 1962, Fleming had already released nine books. The books had sold in bucket loads long before Sean Connery swaggered across the screen. The exotic destinations and big fancy dinners were crucial to the success of the novels. After all, rationing only ended in 1954 in Britain. Fleming's first few books were published when people were forbidden from eating many eggs or meat. I can imagine the thrill of reading about broiled lobster with melted butter would be pretty intense after years of food rationing. The luxury of it all must have been mind-blowing for 1950s readers. The narratives were pretty aspirational around food and travel. Bond casually hops on a plane to America or Africa. Astonishing ideas for most people at the time. Through the pages of a Bond novel, you could visit the African savanna or the fabulous casinos of Las Vegas. You could even imagine a transatlantic stopover in Ireland in the exotic, or perhaps not so exotic, surroundings of Shannon Airport. On his way to the States, Bond has a steak and champagne dinner. On his way to the States, Bond has a steak and champagne dinner in Shannon. But when he decides to browse the shops, I'm afraid that's where tourism gets a lot less glamorous. I'll read it out and you'll see why. A glance at the junk in the airport shops, the Irish horn rosaries, the bog oak Irish harp, 
and the Brass Leprechauns all at $1.50 and the Ghastly Irish Musical Cottage at $4, the Furry Unwearable Tweeds and the Dainty Irish Linen Doilies and Cocktail Napkins. And then the Irish rigmarole coming over the loudspeaker in which only the words BOAC and New York were comprehensible, the translation into English, the last look at Europe and they were climbing to 15,000 feet. The tourist tat hasn't really changed that much. I think you could buy bog oak Irish harps up until very recently. So Shannon isn't particularly exotic. And I'll take it, it's a fair assessment. But calling the Irish language rigmarole? Fuck you, Ian Fleming. So yeah, Bond did offer a fantasy of travel and dining to British people, but also a casual disdain for any culture that wasn't British. This kind of tourism feels horribly colonial. The mad thing about the food scenes is that I found them as disgusting as I'd imagine people reading them at the time found them wonderful. There's no good reason for this because I love to eat and I also enjoy reading about food and fiction. I should like it. As a meat eater and an alcohol consumer, why don't I like it? It wasn't just that I found the food scenes boring. I thought the eating was awful. Bond is this rapacious consumer. His eating is grotesque because he consumes without enjoying it. You know that assessing tendency I mentioned where he's weighing everything up? His eating feels like that. He only eats something when it meets his high standards. It's it's this nasty fastidiousness again. As a character, he exists mostly in relation to what he consumes, whether it be women in nice dresses or fried cutlets. And this tendency isn't limited to the main character. Fleming creates most of the characters this way. To show that their uncouth lowlife, the Italian mobsters, are described as slobbering over spaghetti and meatballs. The disgust with which Bond imagines these criminals eating is really powerful. He's revolted by them. And the strongest emotion in the novel, I thought, was revulsion. It's the only emotion that breaks through Bond's icy cold materialistic nature. And unfortunately, the moments of deepest revulsion occur when he encounters bodies that offend his sense of taste. These other people are merely walk-on parts, cutouts in a novel that takes little time to create atmosphere. Like, I can't emphasise enough to you how paltry the atmosphere is. The horse racing seems to be all about how the gambling works, or some other boring mechanical thing that I've now forgotten. As an emotional experience, most of the scenes are pretty two-dimensional. So occasionally, these other bodies appear to inject some interest and some drama into the story. I'm sorry to say that Fleming thinks racism and fat phobia are reliable ways to lift a dull moment. There's a scene in a mud bath in Kentucky that is gobsmackingly offensive. Bond travels to the baths by bus, where he sees people of colour who are going there for health reasons. His disgust at poor, sick black people struck me so hard. And this, believe it or not, is his reaction to the sulphur baths. He sat there for a few minutes to steel himself for what was going to happen to him through the screen doors and to shake off his sense of oppression and disgust. It was partly, he decided, the reaction of a healthy body to the contact with disease and it was partly the tall, grim Belson chimney with its plume of innocent smoke. But most of all, it was the prospect of going in through those doors, buying the ticket and then stripping his clean body and giving it over to the nameless things they did in this grisly ramshackle establishment. I'm sorry, what the fuck? Belson? Is there a prize for most inappropriate Holocaust metaphor? I found this as disgusting as Bond was finding the mud baths. You'll notice how explicitly he contrasts his clean, white, British physical self with the horror of American poverty and racism that awaits him. Oh, but it gets worse. This next bit is absolutely vile. Bond had no idea what he would see through the door at the end of the room. His first reaction was that he had walked into a morgue. Before he could collect his impressions, a fat, bald negro with a downturned, straggling moustache came over and looked him up and down. 
"'What's wrong with you, mister?' he asked indifferently. "'Nothing,' said Bond shortly. "'Just want a mud bath.' "'Okay, over here,' said the negro casually, "'his big feet slapping against the wet floor "'as he sauntered off about his business. "'Bond watched the huge rubbery man, "'and his skin cringed at the thought of putting his body "'into the dangling pudgy hands with their lined pink palms. "'Jesus fucking Christ!' Okay, but there's actually more. I have to read out a bit more. Bond had a natural affection for coloured people, but he reflected how lucky England was compared with America, where you had to live with the colour problem from your school days up. Right, that was all terrible. James Bond and Ian Fleming can just fuck right off now. Because other people's bodies aren't the same as his, Bond finds them revolting. And you just gotta love the usual deflection excuse of a classic died in the wool racist. Actually, I like black people. It's not that bad. See, I, I'm not a racist. Ugh. It's really grim stuff. This is proper hardcore racism. Fleming actually wrote this and all the Bond novels in Jamaica, where he had an estate called Golden Eye. If you'll remember from my other episode, Errol Flynn had an estate in Jamaica too. Obviously, it was briefly the playground of the not-that-rich but very racist white man. Black bodies aren't the only ones stigmatised in the text. Fleming is disgusted by all non-British bodies. For example, the Italian mobsters are written as grotesques. They're sweating, necklace, obese horrors, and they threaten Bond's life and his girl. I suppose if you like Fleming, you're probably feeling defensive by now and think I'm being unfair. But the reason these moments are so memorable and so objectionable is because the rest of the story is so dull. I ploughed through pages on mob detail that made no difference to the plot. I endured horse racing trivia and I was very bored. To be honest, the only time Fleming writes with verve is when Bond is horrified by other bodies or about to kill someone. There's precious little sex, but there's a lot of violence and racism. The nasty bits are the only parts where the writing works, where the thriller aspects I was hoping for come to the fore. So it's not just that there are some nasty bits. The only good bits are nasty. To be fair, the film adaptations are a lot less offensive. They seem to strip out a lot of the worst aspects of the novels. But anyway, that's enough ranting for now. It's time for censorship bingo. There's a good chance it will help me discover filth I actually missed in the midst of being bored witless. First up, breasts. Well, yes, that one sentence about the valley. It's pretty pathetic, but I suppose it'll have to do. Bestiality, no. Sex work. We are told that Tiffany's mother ran a brothel, so yeah, that'll do as a reference. Racism. Hell yeah, so, so much racism. Drugs. No, I didn't see any drugs. They're trafficking diamonds, not drugs. Politics. Interestingly, this is one of the few books I've read that you could call overtly political in a high politics sense. A spy novel, obviously, is concerned with geopolitics. It is especially hilarious that Bond is out to save the Americans from their own gangs, because the US can't do it themselves, you see. Unfortunately, the mob have corrupted the government and the police so much that the lone Britisher has to save the day. A very sensitive Irish censor might object to all that British patriotism and self-absorption. I suppose it's possible we could ticket for that. Swearing. No, I didn't notice any coarse language. Infidelity. No, it's not really important. Bond obviously is not married. Crime. Well, yeah, all of it. It's all about crime. Endless amounts of crime. Genitalia. No. Abortion. No. Orgies. Uh, no. Sexual assault. Yes, you may recall that Tiffany was raped when she was young, and that's why she is not interested in men. So I think the sexual assault here is a bit of a plot device to make the girl seem unattainable. But nonetheless, I suppose it counts. I'll take it. Extramarital pregnancy? No. Masturbation? God, no, I'm sure Bond would never do anything as degrading as that. 
Sex toys? No. Feminism? Well, no. I'm not sure I'd describe it as anti-feminist so much as anti-human. It's just nasty. Divorce? Uh, No, nobody's married. Contraception? No. None of those mundane things are in the text. Menstruation? Well, of course not. Blasphemy? God is entirely absent. Any concept of God is entirely absent. British power and influence is the God, really. Oral sex? No, there's no mention of what actually happens once the screen fades to black. Graphic violence? Not really. I mean, there are moments of violence where people are killed, but these are more stylized and poised. They also function as time for Bond to bring some morality and qualms into the text. He's reluctant to kill. He has these quick internal debates over righteousness. There's a suggestion of guilt. I don't get the impression it's particularly deep or meaningful correspondence with his internal self about what he should do. But, as I said, violence, or anticipation of it, are the only suspenseful moments in the text. So it might not be graphic, but it is memorable. And I think the censors would hate that. Queer content. No, I didn't spot anything, but I'm prepared to admit I was so bored I might have missed it. In total, then, Diamonds Are Forever scores 7 out of 25, which is pretty pathetic. It's a very poor showing. Honestly, it's hard to believe anyone could stick the label indecent or obscene on this novel. It was barely smutty. I just can't believe how lame it was. I had such high expectations. These were partly fueled by a story one of my podcast listeners told me. When Richard was caught reading Dr. No in boarding school, dire consequences awaited. The Dean of Discipline, Father Cornelius, made him watch as Fleming's novel was ceremonially burnt. His school library privileges were suspended for three weeks, so he could only read books from the section reserved for seminarians. That should have been fairly dull. Enterprising Richard, however, enjoyed books on Norse history and World War II, as well as George Orwell's 1984. The mad thing is that Orwell was banned by the state, while Dr. No was not. Father Cornelius must have felt that endangering one's immortal soul with James Bond was a terrible waste of time. And he'd be right there. Next time, it's a novel from an Irish author I'd never heard of until I started the podcast. Brian Moore. He was born in Belfast, identified as Irish, but spent most of his life outside Ireland. His novel, The Lonely Passion of Judith Hearn, was banned in 1955. Inflamed passions bothered the censors, but what's dodgy about lonely ones? I'm fairly sure this isn't an ode to masturbation, but you never know. Till then, keep your hands clean and your minds filthy. <laughs>